Welcome to the number one podcast covering Michigan State basketball. The Final Four is not in the schedule. Join Rod and me, Eric, as we dive deep into the Spartans to get you prepared for every game. Subscribe today for in-depth recruiting updates and fantastic interviews with today's important college basketball personalities like Robbie Hummel. Thanks for having me. I, uh, I have listened to your guys' podcasts numerous times on drives throughout any Midwestern Big Ten city, so I, I am big fans of your guys' work. Jay Billis. And next time, hey, if anybody in Michigan wants a December tea time, call me. You wimps won't show up, but I'll I'll be there. I'll be there and play in the cold. And Izzo will be in front of the fire with hot chocolate. Coaches Thomas Kelly. Oh, no problem. Glad to be back, man. Glad to be back. Mike Garland. Just can't sit there and trade twos for threes. You can't do it. You're gonna lose. Coming down the stretch, you're gonna lose. And more. You won't find better coverage of Spartan Hoops than you will get here. For both the casual and hardcore fan, come along as we take you for a green and white ride. Hey everybody, it's Eric alongside Rod, here to do our end of the season wrap-up for Michigan State. Michigan State Spartans ended the season 20-15, which included a 10-10 record in the Big Ten, tied for sixth place, and a 1-1 record in the Big Ten and NCAA tournaments, both bowing out in the second rounds. Uh, The Spartans began as a preseason top five pick, but dropped its home opener to James Madison on a 1-for-20 three-point shooting uh, uh, performance. The shooting slump eventually ended, but after a couple of close losses to Duke and Arizona, followed by a disastrous 0-2 start in the Big Ten, uh, Michigan State was reeling, in desperate need for a win, facing top-rated Baylor, and things looked grim. Then, Michigan State miraculously played the best game of the year, trounced the Bears, breathing new life into the program. Uh, They piled up a number of wins over some tomato cans in Indiana State before heading into the Big Ten schedule. Started out okay, but then basically played 500 basketball from there on out to the end of the season. Uh, season characterized inconsistent play, as I just described, uh, certainly at the point, uh, generally mediocre rebounding, historically low turnover rate, which was good on offense, middling free throw shooting worse than has been recently. And I'd say over, mostly really good defense. As we mentioned, I think they were going to the North Carolina game. I think they're ranked sixth or eighth in uh, defense efficiency. So off the court, the Spartans faced other challenges, including a foot injury and surgery, Jackson Kohler, which knocked him out of the first half of the season. He didn't get back and was in a reduced role at least until February or March where he kind of got back to regular duty, you'd say. Uh, Most notably, of course, was the injury to Jeremy Fears, who showed tons of promise as a backup point guard as a freshman, was definitely the most ready of all three freshmen to play, uh, but was uh, sadly shot in the the leg while visiting friends in Illinois, had to have emergency surgery to remove the bullet, uh, and was just never able to recover from the surgery in enough enough time to uh, have any sort of ability to play this season. But by all reports, seems to be recovering well and physically will be ready to go as next year. But, you know, we'll have to wait to see how he does. But, you know, the season wasn't all downer. <laughs> there was a very special moment happened at the end of the Rutgers game, which I think many remember was where uh, grad student Stephen Izzo scored his first bucket and an and one to re- record his first and only collegiate points in front of the Izzo and alumni. And so there were some really great moments. But as I mentioned, they were 20 and 15. And so... Far too often, Rod, we had to come here after a loss and sort of diagnose what had happened. And oftentimes the explanations were pretty similar to <laughs> from game to game. Yeah, it was um, a frustrating season to say the least. And of course, that that's the case in large part because expectations were so high. But, you know, it should be noted, this isn't the first time that this has happened. In fact, it's the third time that this has happened in the Tom Mizzou era. The 2005-2006 team mm-hmm. is, uh, was coming off a Final Four and returned Paul Davis, Shannon Brown, and Mo Ager, not to mention Drew Neitzel, um, <laughs> yeah. from a team that had been to the Final Four a year prior, right? Mm-hmm. Um Then you go to the 2010-2011 team, a team that had been to two consecutive Final Fours and had the likes of Kalen Lucas, Darrell Summers, um, Delwan Rowe, Draymond Green. Yep. um, For a while, at least, Corey Lucius and Chris Allen um, and others all back. Um. And both of those teams actually went out the first round of the tournament. So this one maybe had a slightly worse regular season than those two teams did, but this one actually won a game in the tournament right? before losing. 
Um, those teams both were bounced you know, by George Mason and then by uh, by UCLA, uh, respectively. So it, it's not the first time that it's happened, but it's been a long time. It's been, you know, basically 13 years since we've had a season like this where the, the preseason buildup was so high and the reality during the course of the year was very, very difficult. Yeah. Um, I would note that in both instances, the program bounced back rather nicely from that. Uh, the first go around, they were back in the final four three years later. Um, the second time, uh, it was the next year, they were a one seed mm-hmm. and won a yeah. Big Ten regular season and tournament title. So it is possible we've seen it before with this program. So that's the silver lining for those who wish to be optimists. Um, we've seen it turn around. And and I'll, I'll note in both of those instances, the year after the failure, pessimism was very high, <laughs> very yeah. high, partic- particularly the 06, 07. Yeah. Because that was, that was Drew Neitzel and, you know, uh, a recruiting class that was considered solid, but not world beating. Raymar Morgan was the high, the highlight guy. The other two members of the class were not expected to be huge stars. And then beyond that, you know, you had Travis Walt, and then you had a bunch of guys, Goran Sutan, Drew Namick, um, who hadn't really proven themselves yet, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. And that team carved out an NCAA tournament berth. They beat a number one ranked Wisconsin team during the regular season. They won a game in the tournament, um, you know, before losing to North Carolina. Uh, if that sounds familiar. <laughs> that story. <laughs> um, but, uh, I guess I'm just saying, and we all know what happened with the team in Draymond Green's senior year. So it, it is possible to have that kind of turnaround, even when expectations are muted. And, you know, we're, it remains to be seen what this team is even going to look like next year. I mean, as we're yeah. recording this on, you know, Tuesday, what is it, Tuesday the 26th? 27th? 26th of March, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I think at the moment... And I'll check Twitter just to make sure my momentary <laughs> update is correct. Um, that at the moment, I think the early expectations are that everybody who wants, who they want to come back, who's eligible to come back. Um, I well, I should amend that. Everybody who has eligibility and who's been expected to be a possibility of coming back. So that would include Jaden Aikens. So that would include Xavier Booker. Right. Yeah. It would not include A.J. Hogard. It might include Mati Sissoko. Um, mm-hmm. Is right now expected to be back, particularly with Aikens and Booker. I think those are the two that people were um, the most concerned about. And so for right now, that appears to be the case. But what's going to actually happen when portal season closes um, what are the freshmen ready to do and who do they add, if anybody, to the portal? You know, that's going to yeah. obviously go a long way toward determining. <laughs> we'll address that later. <laughs> right. But but I'm just saying this to to suggest that, you know, expectations don't don't necessarily mean much, which we should have learned mm-hmm. this year in the negative yeah. direction. But it can also cut the other way and has yeah. in the past. Um, you mentioned. You know, defense actually after the Carolina game, it currently sits 11th, but that's still a very, very good defensive team. And it was yeah. an unusual one. They were very good against twos, which is not unusual for Michigan State, but they were maybe the best Izzo team that I can recall, right up there at least, in terms of generating turnovers and specifically steals. Mm-hmm. Um, despite the fact that they didn't really have what I would call an elite shot blocker. They were still 57th in block rate. So solid number really. And and they were mediocre in terms of fouling, which by Michigan state standards is not bad because they've often been worse than that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, the, the one big negative was the defensive rebounding. They were 154 yeah. after, you know, last year <laughs> they were 50th. So that yeah. was a real, that was some real, real slippage in that area, which was, was disappointing to see. But, um, other than that, it was a very, very sound defensive team. Offensively, that's where the real inconsistency came into play. Certain things he did very well. You mentioned that horrible strain at the beginning of the season shooting threes, but they ended up better than 36%, which 
is currently good for 44th in the nation. So pretty good three-point shooting team. Not quite as good as a year ago, but pretty good. It was not a weakness. I think people had trouble, uh, and it's fair to say that they were streaky at times, particularly later in the year. There would be a brilliant shooting game followed by a poor one, followed by a brilliant one, and so on. Um, And and we definitely did see some of that. But, you know, it's hard to knock that that shooting over the course of a full season. Uh, They did a great job, as you said, valuing the ball. By far the best turnover uh, rate of the Izzo era. Um, Did a great job there. Um, But they didn't rebound offensively the way Michigan State teams typically do. They didn't get to the line a lot, which is not that unusual for Michigan State, but what was unusual is they didn't shoot it well when they did get there. Yeah. Just a little under 71%, which is not MSU standard. So, and and they were mediocre shooting from two, which frankly, given that they didn't have a true dominant low post threat is, and, and let's say charitably inconsistent finishing at the rim from the guards... <laughs> Uh, it's probably an accomplishment that they were even number 172. Yeah. So, um, you know, yeah, just an up and down, you know, interestingly, I mean, they, they have two wins over teams that are in the sweet 16. They mm-hmm. beat Baylor and they beat Illinois. So this was a team that we know at its best was capable of playing somewhere close to the level that was expected. They just weren't yeah. able to be at their best consistently enough and and we saw that in that North Carolina game you know for I don't know maybe ten, half of ten that minutes. game yeah no, more half the that. half more than that more than oh that. sure because the second half there's part well of it too the yeah half. I'd right, say right, half, right I'd say half the game half mm-hmm. the game they were considerably better than North Carolina but for the other half of the game North Carolina absolutely crushed them and yeah. so that inconsistency ended up you know, with North Carolina with a double-digit win. And, um, yeah, that was just kind of the story. It was a microcosm of the season in a lot of ways, you know. Um, I think it was just, as we'll get into some of the individuals, I think it was just disappointing that um, veteran players, some, that you kind of hoped and expected would, if not improve on the year prior, at least find a steady level of performance that could be counted on night in, night out. And that didn't happen with enough guys. I would say it happened with two. I would say Tyson Walker, for the most part, and we're never going to know how much his groin injury affected him, as well as Mm -hmm. other nagging injuries. But I, I think for the most part, you could say Tyson Walker played a consistently good season and and maybe after some very early season hiccups, certainly from, I'd say, early January on. So the essentially the last three months, Malik Hall, I think, was great. Best basketball of his career by a long shot. But they didn't get it from enough other guys. And that's why we're talking about this inconsistency. And also the fact that I think it has to be said, partially because of that unfortunate incident with Jeremy Fierce, but also some other things. MSU didn't get as much production out of that freshman class as I think was hoped for. I know certainly yeah. they didn't get as much as I hoped for. Xavier Booker took longer to be able to impact games than I had hoped. Um, Cohen Carr certainly showed vast flashes of potential, but he also showed that he's got a lot of work to do to find consistency in some important areas, you know, defensively especially. Yeah. Um, and obviously, Garrick Norman redshirted, and Jeremy Fears only played in like 11 games. So um, those things happen. But um, I'd say most Michigan State fans were some version of unhappy throughout mm-hmm. the year, which is fair and it comes with the territory. And yep. I don't, well, I'm just speaking for myself here. I don't have a problem with that. I don't think there's anybody that looks at this and says, yeah, it was a great season. A lot to feel good about, feel proud of. No, <laughs> clearly not on any level, but not by Michigan State standards, not by the expectation of this team. Um, well, none of that. It, it, they they fell short. That's obvious. I think the way you react to it is another matter. And 
I, look, I learned this lesson long ago. When I was younger and much more naive, I believed that, you know, well, no, our fan base is, is better than that. And our fan base is sane. And <laughs> that's clearly not true. They're um, human. The Michigan State fan. <laughs> well, the Michigan State fan base is just like all the rest of them, which is to say it's pretty awful. Yeah. Because they all are. I mean, all you got to do is take a stroll around social media and you'll see any school you want to name. You'll see it. Unless they happen to be, Right now, the Connecticut fan base is probably pretty happy. They won't be forever. Yeah, right. You know, every everybody goes through this stuff. And right now, it's it's Michigan State's turn. Um, again, I learned this lesson a long time ago, so this doesn't surprise me. It's still dispiriting to see it, but, um, you know, be that as it may, I, I can't say they're wrong for being disappointed. I can say some of the reaction and and I saw some stuff in the aftermath of the Carolina loss that you know is is really exhibit a for the problems with social media um and and people having access to reach others and yeah. say things they would never say to a person's face right. um would never say if they had if they didn't have and and believe me obviously I respect and believe in the necessity of anonymity to some extent when it comes to engaging on the internet. Um, it's ob for obvious reasons, but mm -hmm. um, I think in this case, you wouldn't, you wouldn't feel empowered to say the kind of things they were saying to these players. Um, if, if that wasn't there. So disappointing yeah. to see that, not surprising, just kind of the cherry on top to an all around, not so great experience for the last few months with um, with Michigan State basketball, which we're you know we don't get very often in the last quarter century. So um, disappointing, but sometimes that's how it goes. Yeah, and I and I'd even mention, of course, the most obvious good and really good outcome was the streak in the NCAA tournament continued, and uh, I know there are plenty of people. Okay, so I'll take back that up. There were some people. <laughs> <laughs> and these may be anonymous Twitter trolls or whatever uh, who are talking about, you know, maybe the best thing to happen is to miss the tournament yeah. and to yeah. wake people yeah. up. And, and of course, there's no advantage to that. Like there's in, like in professional sports where tanking a season improves your draft opportunities and things like that. And I think once we got close to the point where there's a, you know, there's a distinct possibility, certainly on Sunday, I was sweating a little bit during selection Sunday. It would. It seems like, like a complete disaster to not make the NC tournament. I mean, you saw the implications of it, and there were there are no points looking at that and saying there. Yeah, I, well, I mean, yeah, it's obvious, right? But it, there's there's nothing. There's no scenario where you say, well, this is there could be some good that comes out of this. I just could not imagine any sort of good no. that comes out of Here, this tournament. The, well, but here's the fantasy, the the fantastical part of that reasoning is, well, if they don't make the NCAA tournament, that'll that'll force Izzo. Right. Make what, whatever yeah. whatever change that particular idiot feels exactly. yeah. is yeah, yeah. is necessary in the way he runs his program. And the fact of the matter is, you know, that wouldn't have happened. And it's not gonna happen now. I you know, it's funny, and we'll just take half a second to speak on this since we're doing our season ender here. Um, you know, Izzo gave a relatively emotional uh, response at the end of the North Carolina game to uh, assembled, I think it was mostly local media, and it wasn't the formal press conference. It was in the hallway outside the locker room. And mm -hmm. one of the things he said was, you know, I'm going to get us back to making longer runs in the tournament or die trying. Yeah. Okay. So the way a lot of people, uh, from what I can tell, read that was, well, Izzo's going to embrace the portal now, and there's no there's no safety on the roster. You know, if you're not committed enough, you're not good enough. See you later, next. And I listened. I actually watched the entirety of what he said. And to <laughs> me, this is only my read, but to me, what he seemed to mostly be getting at is internal elements of how he runs his program. So he has talked often in the last few years about how he's gotten soft. 
Mm -hmm. But I think there's probably some truth to that. I don't think he treats, uh, he coaches in exactly the same way he did 25 years ago. I mean, I've been told that by people that would know yeah. that he's not the same guy. You know, they tell, oh, this guy is just stuck in his, was stubborn, my favorite word, <laughs> stubborn. And the reality is, no, he's adjusted. But I think what he was saying, my interpretation of what he was saying is, hey, this hasn't worked. So I'm going to get back to being a guy who's a little harder and whose expectations for these kids once they're in the program is that he, that it's conducted kind of in an old school way again. That's how I read it. And I, and I, I drew that based on the totality of the things he was talking about. He was also talking about the effect of social media, one of his favorite hobby horses. But of course, you know, the critics, the people who like to um, focus on one sound bite from the entirety of what he says and paint him as this old codger who doesn't want to get with the times, it frankly ignore the fact that most of what he's focused on is unquestionably objectively correct. Yeah. There is no arguing with the fact that if you as a player are engaging in that stuff all the time, you are going to have negative experiences with it. Now, how it affects you is an individual thing, but he was saying he believed it really affected his players and he hadn't even seen the post North Carolina game diatribes yet. <laughs> he was just talking about what had happened up to that point. Yeah. Now, now the flip side of this is, and people counter with this and there's some, some truth to this that, well, Players have to have social media engagement because that's got a lot to do with their NIL value. So it's yeah, literally branding, making yeah. money for it. Okay, I get that, and it's true. But they've got to find a way, and I think this is what he was saying, that they're going to keep trying to find a way to shield these guys from the worst effects of that stuff. Because I think the sense I got is, he felt like that was a negative factor. Now, was it anywhere close to being the most important thing? Of course not. But did it affect some guys? Did it distract some guys? Yeah, I think so. I think it's fair to surmise that there's probably some level of truth to that, and you can debate how important you think that is in the end. But I think it's true. So to me, that's what he was talking about, right? Was mm -hmm. I'm going to tighten the screws on my program internally. I did not read it as, hey, man, it's open season and everybody's got to fight for their contract, which is what I think a lot of these people that don't really understand that he actually means the stuff he says about the nature of the program he wants to run, that, that they don't get. And so they heard those words and they thought, okay, this is finally getting with it. It's going to be Eric Musselman time. And we're going to bring in eight guys in the portal and, you know, whoever wants to stay can fight it out. Best man win. It just isn't, you know, Mati Sissoko is an interesting one, right? Because you and I have taught, and my assumption, I think yours as well, had been that, well, Mati's probably going to be done, right? I don't know that that's the case. Uh, yeah, I, I, once I thought about it, I thought, you know, actually it makes much more sense right. that he doesn't, but I never really... Put much right. thought into it. But yeah, yeah. I know what you're saying. Right. And, and and Izzo said that. He was asked specifically about Madi and AJ because they have the ability to take the COVID year. Right. And the answer he gave was telling. The way I read his answer was probably more likely than not that Madi Sissoko is back. Mm -hmm. And I thought about it. I thought, you know, how could I have ever thought otherwise? <laughs> right. I think Tom Izzo, well, I just think Tom Izzo, my sense is he feels like he owes a responsibility to Mati Sissoko, right? For a lot of good reasons. And Mati Sissoko has done nothing wrong except maybe not catch a basketball at times the way people watching on TV would like him to. Yeah. But in terms of the things Tom Izzo values, he's done not anything wrong that I've ever heard of. And so I think it's probably more likely than not that he's back. Mm-hmm. A.J. Hogard, he said, you know, it was always kind of the expectation, the understanding that A.J. was going to go. Now, I think it'll be interesting to see whether A.J. goes pro or whether he opts to go on the portal and go somewhere else, but I'd be 
Lord, if he's back. I I think that so, chance is very small, but yeah, right. Well, it would make it a 13-man roster, so theoretically they could, but I just don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't see it. So, again, these are, if you believe that somehow this a new day had dawned and Tom Izzo was going full Machiavelli <laughs> on this thing, um, the, the answer to the Mati Sissoko question probably should have given you pause, you know? Yeah. And, and again, I look at this, I see a lot of people, I'm sure well-meaning people, people who think they're right, believe, well, Michigan State's got to have at least two portal guys. Mm-hmm. Look at the roster. Yeah. Who goes? Yeah. Who goes? I don't think they're going to go with 13. So if you assume right now they're at twelve, if AJ goes, Mahdi comes back, they'd be at they'd be at twelve. I believe that's right. Um so who goes? Normally the candidates for the portal are gonna be guys who have been in your program at least for a little while, who have had their chance and it just hasn't panned out. Um, that's normally the equation, right? But look at look at the veterans. So do they want to recruit over Trey Holloman? No. Do they want to recruit over Jaden Akins? No. Uh, do they want to recruit over Cohen Carr? No. Xavier Booker? No. Right. Um, and then beyond that, you're talking about Garrett Norman and Jeremy Fierce, who didn't play or didn't play much. They're not going to recruit over them, and they're not going to recruit over the three incoming freshmen. So... It really means you're talking, and if Mahdi is coming back, then you're really down to the two guys who just finished their sophomore year at center, Jackson Kohler and Carson Cooper. Those are your, oh, and they're not going to recruit over Jer, um, um, Jeremy Fears, obviously. Jesse, yeah. Jesse, Jesse, McCullough. Oh, Jesse McCullough. Yeah, right. I mentioned Fears, Jesse McCullough either. He's an incoming freshman. So it's really two guys are your only candidates. Now, I do think it's possible, I might even say probable, that at least one of those two guys might well leave. And you're talking about two guys, you're talking about Kohler or or Cooper. And Cooper. Yeah. And Cooper. They're the only guys who fit that profile. Yeah. Right? Where they've had two years in the program, you could say, well, we got to get better at this position, so we intend to bring somebody in, and if we do, the minutes just aren't going to be there for you. Mm -hmm. They could do that, but that's it. So this idea that there's going to be these wholesale changes, not unless somebody opts to leave. You know, if Jaden Akins decides he wants to go somewhere else, okay, then you're then you're talking about bringing in somebody to take that spot. Yeah. But short of that, I just so I think this this belief in parts of the fan base that there's going to be this sea change. I don't see it, man. I think what Tom Izzo is talking about is I want to get back to the program that I've operated and the way I've operated it for most of my career. I've tried it this other way. It's not working for me. It's not working for the kids. And we're going to get a little tougher. And I think he's, I think he probably also thinks that, and this is supposition on my part, but let's call it at least slightly educated supposition. (laughs) Um, I think he thinks he's got a group of players who, especially at a key position, are better equipped to handle that. Sure. I think he can probably coach Jeremy Fears and Trey Holloman, and I would venture to say probably Jace Richardson too, about as hard as he wants, and it'll be fine. Yeah, yeah. I don't know that that was the case with this team. Yeah, I think they did just finish the season. And I think this just goes so, anyway. This just goes to the to show. I think, um, you know, uh, we're obviously very pro MSU. We're supportive of Tom Izzo generally speaking, because of his track record. I mean, if your floor as a program is making the NCAA tournament and you, yeah. you know, I mean, that's a pretty damn good floor. I mean, if you look, if you think about it, everyone is, you know, touting all these new ways of running programs like, Jer- uh, what's his name? Jeremy Tang or whatever at Kansas state. Well, they didn't make the Jerome tournament. Tang, Jerome Tang. Yeah. They didn't make the tournament this year, right? They had all the, tr- the transfers last year. They were yep. you know, amazing. And this year, nothing. Uh, it doesn't mean that you can't, you know, and, and again, it doesn't mean you can't win different ways. They're, of course, right. as many different ways to win and have a successful program as there are people in the world, right? And so that's, you know, there's no right formula. The landscape's always changing. Uh, and I think, to there's no one who could be, uh, have a floor of making the NCAA tournament 
who is not willing to adapt and to change to the way trends are in either the game or the landscape as far as like players or how recruiting works or NIL, all this sort of thing. And so I think the the stubborn sort of label that's turned around, I think it's unfair. I mean, I think you, you could there, he certainly has many traits. I think loyalty might be a better trait. There may be some, uh, you know, if you're 40 and saying things he says, you're not called stubborn, you're called other things, but it's, it's not any different, right? You see other people say the same things, complaining about social media, complaining about, uh, you know, the portal, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I certainly don't think is those infallible. And I'm sure, you know, if you could get him, and I don't think he publicly would ever say, you know, did he think he misevaluated his team going into the season? Would he have done things differently? As you mentioned, he's already said, he's already gone through the self-evaluation phrase. You know, not only he's going to go through his himself and the staff, then he's going to go through the players and they're going to talk about, you know, what they're going to do differently next year. I don't think there's any yep. question about that. And and the the notion that he's unwilling to do certain things that are required to win in today's modern game is, I think, silly. Uh, I think there's certain things in fundamentals and principles that he'll maintain, whether that's on defensive or offensive principles. Uh, but I think we've seen those change too. And we've seen, you know, he's doubly more, let's say, you know, they're on defense. It's different. It's a different way Absolutely. of playing, right? And so the, to to sort of, you know, label him as a guy who's unwilling to change and like, you know, a, a rock in the motion uh, is, I think, silly. And it's and and I do think, I know we've talked about it a couple times this season. I think the, the large problem this season was is not only did you have very high expectations for the season, I think for good reason, but, you know, maybe we overestimated what the, the steps with players would make. Uh, but certainly the fact that the football program not only fell apart, but it was a complete scandal and just, you know, completely disintegrated in the way it sort of fell apart this year. And then there was the anticipation, well, at least we got basketball. And then that was, you know, started out with a loss of James Madison, one for 20 shooting, and all these kind of problems that were totally unexpected. Uh, I think that just fed into this sort of bad sort of stew and then you throw in social media and the ability for people to kind of you know develop narratives and have ideas for how they can fix things uh anyway so i think that all sort of feeds into to a bad maelstrom of negativity and that's the team yeah. and that the, it just been unable to, to escape that in sort of the general sort of you know whatever the the but i think but i do think that the team itself uh to their credit did not like to fall apart and and I feel like one of the teams you mentioned, I think the one of Darrell Summers was at 12, yes. 13. That team sort of like was not good a good team. Like they had all kinds of internal strife, I think, at the time. Yep. And they just didn't yeah, play well together. So that was not an issue with this team, which is, you know, like, to their credit, they kind of, you know, circled the wagons a little bit. I think they just, they maybe didn't have the best leadership in the locker room in general, like just people who could handle sort of these sorts of situations. But they at least stayed together as a team, which, you know, some credit to them. Here, here's here's the thing. So when you look at next year, if if you're just talking about the guys that are currently on the roster that we think will be back, you are you are talking about a very young group. Yes. So seven seven out of twelve guys would be sophomores or freshmen. Okay, mm -hmm. and then your veterans are guys like. <laughs> You know, Jade Nakin, one Scotty Sissoko. And one grad for us. <laughs> right. Yeah. Ja Jackson Kohler, Carson Cooper, Trey Holland. Yeah. Of that group, the only guy that I think has innate leadership, inclination, ability, however you want to term it, is Trey Holland. Yeah, I agree. And and I we've talked about a lot. I think Jeremy Fears is going to be a leader. I think it'll be interesting to see the freshmen that come in um, I think just the little bit that I know about him, I wouldn't be surprised to see Jace Richardson have kind of a forceful presence for this program going forward. But the, the thing that's good about this is the path is cleared for younger guys. You know, yeah. you mentioned that team in 10, 11. Well, that team had a junior year Draymond Green, and you would say, well, that's one of the best leaders Michigan State basketball's ever had. And yet we were talking about that team absolutely falling apart. Well, how could that happen? Part of the reason it happens is in college, it's a very hierarchical thing, and it's very difficult for a younger guy, even one who has innate leadership traits, to assert themselves fully when there are older guys around. Right. 
who aren't going to let that happen. It's not even done out of malevolence. It's just how it is. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's not going to be a problem next year. Yeah. The opportunity is going to be there. And so if, if you're looking to reset the program, well, there's an opportunity next year. And, and in conjunction with that, I think they have guys who are of the right mindsets who are capable of stepping into those roles, into that vacuum and filling it. So there's a chance that this thing turns around in that regard. I don't know what it's going to look like in terms of wins and losses. That's to be determined. And, you know, the one caveat to this is they could bring somebody in through the portal that actually ends up having that kind of presence. That's possible. Sure. But but for now, you know, I personally think this is probably going to be Trey Holloman and Jeremy Fears' team. I would think so. For from a, a leadership years. perspective. Yeah. From a leadership perspective, that's how it sets up to me. Yeah. And I'm more than okay with that. After witnessing the last four years where I felt like that was really lacking, um, I'll take what comes if you can assure me that it's going to be their locker room and it's going to be their team. Um, I feel good about where that will get things going in the long run. And to me, that's much more important than adding some guy who scored 20 points a game at a mid-major to the portal. Because <laughs> I'm talking about the, the big picture. Yeah. Not the macro, not having enough firepower so you win an extra couple games in the regular season. Who gives a sh this is, a, I mean, it, and this is the thing. These people who talk to me, you were talking about, well, the, the accomplishment was keeping this NCAA tournament streak going, and that gets belittled by some people, you know, as as you mentioned. Um, but if you're really, if you say you're really concerned about big picture stuff, and hey, all we really care about here and hang banners for <laughs> are conference <laughs> championships and final fours yeah. and national titles, okay, fine. If that's what you want, you better care a whole hell of a lot about what I'm talking about. Yeah. About leadership and who's got the reins of this team. Who are the voices that the team, the rest of the team is going to listen to and respond to? Who's going to set the tone? That stuff is what is the building block, at least in the Michigan State program it has been. It is the building block for what gets you to that level. You know, much more so than let's go find somebody who shot 39% from three for South Midwestern Tech State last year. You know, it just, it is, it's much, much more important. That's not to say you can't find a good player who can help you in the portal, but what are we talking about here? Yeah. Well, no, I absolutely right. I totally agree. Uh, well, I want to, before we go further, we're going to go through the individual players here to kind of break down how they d did for the season. So, Want to introduce everyone to our brand new sponsor of the show. We liked it. Very excited to have the Christian Brothers Automotive, which is a automotive repair shop. Uh, it's a nationwide one, but they have a number of franchises in the West Michigan area. <clears throat> and so we're thrilled to have them on board. Uh, it's actually where my foster son works, and so I'm super excited. And the reason uh, that's exactly the only place he's worked since getting out of uh, mechanic school at the community college and he loves it there because they are an honest mechanic. And if you, if you're someone who, that's like the the scariest thing when you move to a new town, like you know where to get your car fixed because there's so many people who are, well, just say crooked. You know they, you know you don't trust them when they go in. There's something you know get you have to get fixed. And so to have some place that you feel comfortable going and you're not worried about just someone just trying to rip you off, uh, is great. And so they're gonna they're gonna come on board and so they're gonna be with us for a while. So I really. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, if you're around the area, you can check them out. You can get their, if they want to give $20 off for oil changes. So if you mention final four, you can get $20 off. Mention you would listen to the show. Uh, it does get the Christian brothers and I'll have more information later uh, when I get more stuff, but they just kind of came on board today. So want to welcome them. Uh, there'll be a great addition. And again, as we just focus on sponsors who are really awesome. And so just like the Squeegee squad of Grand Rapids, the brothers of Jesse Gutters and nudge printing, we only have really great sponsors in the show things that we believe in, products we use, because, you know, frankly, that's who I want to make sure is uh, I want to promote. I don't want to promote stuff that people I don't like <laughs> or I'm unwilling to use. And I know you feel the same way, Rod. Uh, so let's talk about, let's go through the roster here. We'll go do a couple of players and just kind of um, 
talk a little bit about other stuff. So we'll begin with uh, the guards, I suppose. We'll start with um, with Tyson Walker, who played the most minutes in the team, 1,120 minutes, played started 34 of 35 games this season. Skip that one game. I don't remember what game it was now. It was early in the year. Um, just got to yeah. get to take a day off. So he averaged almost 33 minutes a game. He shot 45% from the field. He had 64 threes, shooting 37.6%. Uh, actually his uh, percentage from the free throw line was all got all the way up to almost 75% by the end of the season, but he was like in the sixties for much of the year. Yeah. Uh, it was really a struggle there for some reason and actually did pretty good rebounding. Uh, he had nine, almost a hundred rebounds in the season, averaging almost three a game and uh, 96 assists to 46 turnovers, 64 steals for the season and uh, even four blocks. Yeah. So, I mean, he was Michigan State's best player. Obviously, he was almost averaging, he was averaging well over twenty points a game for a while. Finished averaging eighteen point four, and he's the guy who, if we had to say, as you mentioned before, he's the one who was better than he was last year, and maybe that's just because he's a little more assertive. And um, I don't know. I mean, he was a great season, and it's just too bad that it sort of, they kind of the, the season was the way it was because I think he would have been more heralded <laughs> had they had a better season. Yeah, I think that's true. He had he had a senior year that would certainly stack up in a lot of ways with some of the better players of the Izzo era. You know, um, you, you wouldn't put it quite in the category of, you know, the Mateen Cleaves, Morris Petersons, um, I guess Denzel Valentine or Draymond Green because they were national player of the year level. But um, just below that, I, I would put him up there with, Guys like Travis Trice, yeah, um, Drew Neitzel, um, you know, Alan Anderson, people like that that really had uh, Charlie Bell really had very very good senior years. But you're right; it probably won't get remembered quite that way because the team and the teams, the three years that he played at Michigan State, are are not up at the top by by program standards. But, you know, you look at across the board, I mean, for, for all the health stuff and the ups and downs, the final numbers are still really good. 38% from three. You might have hoped he would have been a shade better than that, but it's not terrible. You could live. If I told you 38% before the start of the season, I, I think I think most people probably would have been okay with that because they would have figured correctly that he would have had a lot of attempts. He was second on the team in attempts. Yeah. With 170, I thought where he got a lot better though was finishing at the rim. Oh my goodness! I mean, he so shot 40. Yeah. He shot 45 percent overall from the floor. So, um, that's good stuff. And and he really did kind of master that kind of Isaiah Thomas um, going high off the glass <laughs> yeah. uh, shot to finish over bigger players. And I mean, he just hit some shots that seemed almost impossible this year. So it was really good there. You mentioned the free throws. It was such a weird thing. But yet, you know, of the guys in the regular rotation, he still ended up he ended up third. I mean, so almost 75 will round it up to 75%. Yeah. Um, it's not terrible. But, but, you know, again, Tyson Walker has been an 80% plus guy at certain points in his career. So... It was weird to see it. I don't quite know what went on there, um, but it was a problem that he he mostly got on top of toward the end of the season. You mentioned the two better than two to one assist to turnover ratio for your secondary point guard, pretty solid, and he led the team in steals with sixty four on a team where steals actually mattered. Yeah. So you know, almost just shy of two a game. Um, hard to hard to bag on his season. You know, if the team had been better, he would have been a first team all Big Ten guy in my in my eyes. Um it was second team as it as it ended up, but uh definitely a guy that I'm glad Michigan State was able to get out of the transfer portal. I think he made a lot of great contributions to this team over three years. And um boy, at times can you imagine this team without him? You know? No, uh it would yeah, have been. It would have been a tough road for sure. Um, but uh, best of luck to him as as he as he goes forward into his his basketball future. But um, yeah, he he basically gave you 
a reasonable version of what you would have expected from him coming into the season. Yeah. All right, let's move on to number three, Jaden Akins. So he started all 35 games this year, played nearly 1,000 minutes, uh, averaging 28 and a half minutes a game, shooting 41% from the field. Uh, he had also had exactly the 64 three-pointers with on a few more attempts, so he ended up at 36.4%, shot 74% from the line on very low volume, 17 for 23. He, yeah. uh, he averaged a little under four rebounds a game. Um, and let's see, he had 42 assists to 34 turnovers, 39 steals, 14 blocks. So, um, yeah, I mean, Jaden did not take the step we had expected. He was, last year was understandable because he was injured and really never came. I mean, he had the same thing that Jackson Kohler did, except he's expected to be more dynamic and athletic. Uh, so we really had low anything you got of Jaden Akins last year, especially the season you're, you're happy with. And this year his shooting was down from a three point range. And, um, he, I think just, you know, tried to, especially early in the season was trying to be something that he wasn't or with his handle, you know, trying to, trying to do what the scouts yeah. want him to do. I think he was trying to find a new role and maybe that's partly because he was playing the three, but I think it's partly just because it's just not his game. I don't know what you think about that. Well, I think it was a disappointing season for him. Uh, th- there's there's no other way to put it. You know, they believed coming into last season that he was their best player before he got hurt. Yeah. And then, as you say, it took a while for him to round back. Even after he was back, it took a while for him to find his level. But then when he did, the way he was playing at the end of the season in the NCAA tournament, he looked like the kind of guy they were talking about Yeah, in the preseason. So their expectations were very, very high. And, you know, him coming back was kind of a touch-and-go thing for a while. But the way that got done, and both he and Dizzo talked about it in the preseason, was there was a lot of talk about Jaden getting more chances to be dynamic with the ball in his hands, playing off pick and roll, not just being a spot-up shooter. And it didn't go well. I mean, you look at, you look at those numbers, he... He had some spectacular finishes at the rim, but frankly, 41% shooting overall is not good enough. No. Um, I think the fact that he only took 23 free throw attempts on the year is really, it says something. I mean, it's less than Halloween. When you play, <laughs> when you play 20, when you play 28 and a half minutes a game over 35 games, you only attempt 23 free throws. That's, that's a problem. And, you know, the three-point shooting was decent, but down from what he had done previously, certainly did not quite meet expectations. It wasn't a disaster, but I think the problem was, you know, we talked about the team, especially late in the year, having very much an up-and-down kind of performance. There was no consistency from game to game. And I think a lot of that actually mirrored and was impacted by Jade Nakins. He could have games where he could bust seven threes on you, and then he could have other games where he went one for eight. And it happened a lot that way. So, you know, defensively, I thought he was mostly good. There's another level he can get to. And the rebounding, you know, 3.9 rebounds a game doesn't look terrible, but I expected more there too. Yeah. So, um, you know, and only, I mean, he did end up, what did he end up? I guess he ended up fourth on the team in offensive rebounding, and it was behind Malik Hall and two centers. So, you know, not terrible there. But again, he's a guy who I think has as much potential as a rebounder as any perimeter guy they've had since Charlie Bell. Any any guy you'd call a guard, at least, yeah, since Charlie Bell. So 3.9 a game fourth on the team in offensive rebounding, that comes up a little short too. As I say, plenty of time for things to change. At the moment, it seems like there's an inclination that he will be back, and I think there's a suspicion that they may move him into the role that Tyson Walker had, which would be more of what we were talking about, where he's asked to be a little more dynamic. Now, as you mentioned, the question is, is that really in his best interest and the team's best interest? I think that's a fair question because we did not see the development in terms of his ability to utilize 
the dribble to get opportunities for himself. We just did not see that happen. Now, you could say, well, that's usage, but I don't think that was entirely it. I think there was an attempt to let him try to do that, and it didn't work out very well. Yeah. Does that change with another offseason? I don't know. Um, but I do know that I would rather have him back than not. I know that much because I still think there's a very, very good basketball player inside of Jade Nakins. Yeah. And I think he's got a chance to make good on that as a senior. Yeah. And I mean, just to give an example too, like he was averaging four rebounds a game. So same as last the year, the year before, and he's averaging 42% yeah. from three. So quite a drop off in his shooting yeah. from this year. I mean, that's obvious yeah. when he was watching. And again, this is one of those things where you wonder is these are the unknowns, which we won't obviously can't know till next year, but you know, is a change in leadership is a change in the point guard position. Is that going to be something that's going to, going to open up opportunities and make right. and maybe, maybe it'd be helpful. I mean, I don't know. It, it could be, it could be freeing for him Absolutely. too. Absolutely. Absolutely. Does a does a change in, you know, and this isn't even, uh, you know, uh, uh, this, this can easily get, get twisted into a, Oh, they just hate player X. It's not even about that. It you know, like I don't I don't have any indication that Draymond Green hated Kalen Lucas and Darrell Summers. But it's very clear those guys needed to leave for him to step up right into being the play. It was just crystal clear. Yeah. That had to happen. Cassius Winston really needed, I would say, not just the lottery picks, Miles Bridges and Jaron Jackson. But I would say even early that next year, he hadn't quite become no. the super, the college superstar he became until Josh Langford and Nick Ward went out with injuries. Yeah, he had to. And now, then, yeah. they, didn't have any, they didn't have any problems at all with those guys. He didn't. But it was just the space was no longer occupied. So sometimes that is what has to happen. Is it possible that the space that even somebody like Tyson Walker, who I think was a very unselfish player, not a problem at all. You'd love to have him every day of the week playing for you. But might his absence be something that allows Jaden Akins to grow and fill that void in ways that we didn't see this year? Yeah, maybe. We'll see. Well, let's move on to the player in question here as far as the Michigan State's point guard, A.J. Hogard, who started 34 of 35 games. Played a little over a thousand minutes, so he averaged twenty eight point seven point uh, minutes a game. He shot forty, a little under forty one percent for the from the the field. Twenty five of seventy two for three, so for th- almost thirty five percent. He was almost seventy nine percent from the line, so very good, just like it was the year before. And uh, let's see, three a little over three rebounds a game. 183 assists to 64 turnover. So about a three to three to one assist to turnover ratio. Almost three to one. Yeah. 50 yeah. turn, 50 steals, 11 blocks. He was second in the team in steals. So statistically, I mean, in many ways you're like pretty good. Um, especially the, the steals, but as we know, watching on the, the product of the court, and I, you know, I don't want to be a guy who bags AJ Hogard, and that's not the point. We certainly talked about plenty this season. We don't need to talk about it too much, but I think, you know, it, these, these numbers belie certain games where he's very, very good and other games when he's not. Yep. Where he shoots 40, some games he shoots 65, 70%, and other games he's shooting 20. And, you know, like the North Carolina right. game is a great example. One for 10 from the field. Uh, we're just missing layups. And you watch the guy and you've seen him play exceptional basketball, like unstoppable as from a point guard position, and in other games just not. And it's just baffling. And I'm sure Izzo has two or three extra gray hairs after the last few years with AJ trying well, to get him to perform the way he thinks he can. There were a couple of quotes about AJ Hogard in the last couple of weeks of his MSU career, what I'm assuming is the end of his career. Um that I think really laid it all out. Izzo made a comment about guys not practicing shots <laughs> they actually take in the game. So what does that mean? Well, I think in this case, it means AJ wasn't working on the shots he tends to get in games, which a lot of them are at the rim. Yeah. And his ability to finish this year was not where it needed to be, to put it mildly. 
for a guy who plays the offensive game A.J. Hogarth does, to shoot a little under 41% is not great. Now, that three-point number looks pretty healthy. If I told you before the season, oh, he shoots 35%. You'd be pretty happy with that. Well, yeah. well, it's pretty good. And and that number came on late. He got better late in the year. Early yes. on, he was struggling. He got better. But you look at it, he only took 72. That's He basically attempted two threes a game. So while that number is fine and it represents improvement, he wasn't taking enough of those. He didn't even average one made three a game. He wasn't taking enough of them to where that was a major impact. Yeah. So you you need, if you're looking at him, you need to look at the two-point shooting. And it wasn't good enough. You know, the assist to turnover numbers look fine. But it, as you say, there were games where he was spectacular. And there were games where he really struggled. And I would also say the thing that's not accounted for at all in the focus on the counting numbers is his defense. Right. When A.J. Hogarth is locked in, A.J. Hogarth is capable of being a very good collegiate defender. There is no doubt about that. Was he locked in consistently this season? Absolutely not. <laughs> no. <laughs> Absolutely not. And I think that you're also missing the point if you don't talk about the, the other things that aren't measured by counting numbers. So intangibles, leadership, uh, body language the way you interact with teammates. Um, you can be, obviously, because we've had lots of examples of it in this program, you can be a fiery leader and be effective. You can be a guy that gets after teammates and be effective. But if you're going to do that, you need to have accountability. You know, Draymond Green could do that stuff because he held himself accountable for his own performance. Right? Mm -hmm. Mateen Cleaves absolutely was that kind of guy. Travis Walton. I mean, I can go down the line of the great leaders this program's had, the guys who were demonstrative and would get in teammates' faces. But you got to be able to back it up. You know, otherwise, people, don't, it's not having the effect you need it to have. And I would argue that that was never the case with him. Yeah. You know, that, that, that stuff was going on. For four years, I never saw it change. Not consistently. Might change over the course of a given game, but then it would, it would come back up. Yep. We saw it against in the last game of his career. We saw it against North Carolina. So I think those those were the issues. You it AJ Hogard is sort of a Rorschach test in terms of <laughs> how you view um, what matters and. His numbers give you enough that if you want to spin it into, well, okay, it wasn't perfect, but that was actually a pretty decent year, you can find some support for that position. Yeah. But I think you've missed the forest for the trees. Yep. Yeah, I think the for me, the, the things that were telling is after the Butler game, the... <laughs> the way Pierre Brooks reacted in the, in the um, yeah. handshake line yeah. with AJ. So clearly there was some not good to teammate sort of whatever, you know, did not leave well uh, with Pierre Brooks, who from all accounts yeah. that I can tell pretty well liked guy on the team and like a pretty nice kid. So it's surprising that that was the case. And at senior night, uh, when Izzo gives it talks about every player, and he just put his hand towards AJ and just said, AJ. <laughs> That's all he said. Uh, Cause I think everything has been said at that point between those two. So anyway, well, and, you know, and, and, and not to just to wrap this up, cause this is hopefully the last time we'll, we'll have to talk about it. Um, I had this discussion on, on the Spartan mag board and we all know there were various hobby horses that segments of the fan base got hooked on this year, you know, why didn't you go to the portal to get a five? Not playing Xavier Booker enough. You know, yeah. all these all these different things. But to me, the 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 one major criticism that I have of Tom Ezzo in recent years, the only one that I think really truly matters significantly was the recruiting decision he made four years ago at that position. And, you know, I had problems with it when they offered him. 
I had problems with it after his freshman year. I happen to know after his sophomore year, there was a real internal debate within the program of whether to cut bait with AJ, which they don't do very much. Yeah. You know, we know that. And the decision was made on both sides for him to come back. And then he showed enough as, a, you know, I understand it. Once they got into the weeds with it, he would show you just enough yep. to believe that, okay, he's turning. How many times did we say, maybe <laughs> I think he's, he's turned yeah, the corner? I think he's figured out. I know. I, I can't remember. How time many times? <laughs> so when I, I think now the data is in, we can make a conclusion. And the conclusion that I have is they made a mistake and they paid a price for it. And so, we, you know, the last four years have been what they've been. But in this program, I'm sorry. It, it, it From Judd Heathcote talked about it. Tom Izzo has talked about it. Fundamentally, Michigan State basketball is a guards program. And because of the nature of the offense that Tom Izzo has run, it's not a motion game. It's not a flex offense. Not these, these schemes that don't really prioritize putting the ball in the hands of one player to initiate your offense. It's more of a shared responsibility. That's not Michigan State basketball. It's right. always been a point guard-centric offense. So it matters hugely who your point guard is, disproportionately in this program as compared to some others. And and even more so with the the pressure and the stress that Tom Izzo is going to put on that player. Yeah. And I think there was no more consequential decision. If you were talking about one decision made that impacted in a way no other decision did over the last four years, it was that one. And I I would suspect that was also one of the other things he was referring to when he had that post-game chat with reporters after the Carolina loss. Yep. Just my opinion. Certainly could be in there somewhere for sure. Uh, and then oh, I don't, I don't doubt it was. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll move on to Trey Holloman, who is a sophomore guard returning. He started two of the 35 games this season, uh, averaged almost 20 minutes a game. Certainly his, his minutes ticked up after the injury to Jeremy fears. He shot 47% from the field overall hit 34 threes out of 80. So he shot 42 and a half percent the season on pretty decent volume. I mean, 83, three attempts. Uh, he was yeah. 20 for 25 from the line for 80%. So not much of the free throw action. Uh, he averaged a little under about one and a half rebounds a game, 84 assists to 30 turnovers. So a little under three to one. He was at a way mountains higher than that. Uh, but yeah. as soon as he got more usage, that definitely came down a little bit. 21 steals, nine blocks, Without a doubt, he was very improved, and you know there were a number of people coming into the season wondering what his role would be, whether he'd even ever play, if he's going to be the backup to the backup, you know, behind, playing behind uh, Jeremy Fears. Uh, and then he showed that he had a role, and that one of them was a, as a shooter, which I thought I remember Moneyball as a freshman before the freshman year. I thought, oh, he looked pretty good, and then he just was I don't know, mm -hmm. he maybe hit what three or four threes all season or something like that. He hardly it was not part of his game. He was just a guy to take care of the ball. But a guy who definitely exhibited not only um, not only good skills on the basketball court, but I think you know you really saw it emerging late. I think best exemplified in the Big Ten tournament game against Purdue, where I mean this guy is tough as nails. I mean he's standing up to Zach Eady defending yep. his defending his teammates. Yep. And uh, you know, as you mentioned, this is the I, this is going to be the new sort of the new one of the new leaders in the in the clubhouse, and so I th I think they're going to be. It's going to be a very different mentality, and it's going to be a different sort of attitude on the court, I think, going forward. One that is not one of, well, one that's more of accountability, let's say, and toughness. Absolutely. Um, look, I think on balance, he had a great sophomore year. I think the the shooting from three is not a mirage because his, his stroke looks good, and the results were good. So what is there to argue with? Doesn't mean he's going to, shoot 43% from three again next year. But I think I think we've seen enough to conclude Trey Holloman is a good shooter. Yes. His two his two points overall percentage was even better, 47%. <laughs> yeah. That was the highest among their guards by a considerable margin. The next highest was Tyson Walker at 45. So a full 2% higher. 
That's impressive. And we saw Trey start to show that. He has the ability to get to the rim and finish. He get to the mid-range and connect. Um, I think he's got the potential to be a varied offensive player. I think he's also got the potential to be an outstanding defensive player. And I think that's the nice thing about Michigan State next year, even aside from the freshmen. If you just look at, again, assuming Aikens is back, if you look at Aikens and Fears and Holloman as a threesome, there's no defensive slippage no. from this year. In fact, they might even be better I would be because I think so. they'll be more consistent. Yeah. Maybe a I think they'll smaller. be more consistent. I, I think you're you're right to point out that as Trey's usage went up, he had an absurd like five to one assist to turnover ratio going yeah. early in the year. That came back to earth as they asked more of him, but it's still really good. He finished third on the team in assists um, behind uh, AJ, obviously, and then a little bit behind Tyson with significantly less minutes. Um, but I think he's got. I think he's got real potential there too, as as uh, your second option at the point. I don't think he'll be the starter. I think the question is going to be with him next year: is is he in an elevated role from this season, or is he in a similar role? Meaning, are they starting him? In which case, you're once again very small on the perimeter, and Jaden Akins is still your three man. Or do you decide that Jaden Akins moves to the two, you go with somebody bigger, whomever that might be, at the three, whether that's a new player, whether that's, you know, Tang or Cohen Carr or Gary Normand, and let that guy play the three with a little more size and have Trey coming off the bench, much as he did this year, playing some point, playing some off ball, and and kind of that all-purpose utility role. I think that's a question, but I think regardless of which role he's in, you're going to see even better overall basketball from him because I think he's going to continue to work and continue to grow. And he certainly showed significant potential this year to do those things and to continue to progress. And as you say, I think having him as kind of with the path now cleared to him having a more significant voice is only a good thing. Yeah. So I'm I'm really excited about Trey Holloman. Yeah, me me as well. And yeah, it'll be interesting to see what his usage is. And just because we can't envision what it's going to be, like we this year, we really weren't sure. I think it turned out fine. And I think you know, who knows? He could there there are definitely roles in Michigan State where you can be the sixth man on the bench, getting almost starters minutes, and be just Absolutely. as important. You know, we saw the Mo Pete, right? I mean, he was the sixth Absolutely. man, but he was like one of the best players in the league. <laughs> uh, there've been lots of guys like that. Yeah. Um, I, and and here's the other thing, too. I would not write off the possibility that Trey Holloman becomes a much more significant scorer for Michigan State than he was this year. He averaged basically six points a game this year. If someone was to tell me that he ends up averaging double digits next year, it wouldn't shock me. No. no I think no. that's possible. Because he showed enough variety in his game. Yes, he shot jumpers very well, but it wasn't just that. As you say, he got to the line more than Jaden, averaging, you know, nine minutes a game less playing time. Yeah, one so, third less minutes than the Aikens played. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty significant, and I think he's got more of that in him. Yeah, and I and I, I guess, guess his, his confidence continues to grow. We didn't even talk about it, but certainly when it, it, the break, he's, his ability to push the ball is really good. His ability to see players Absolutely. up ahead and pass up ahead. Uh, and, he's and got good vision. You know, that's another reason why I think there are elements of Michigan State that could potentially be better next year. Yeah. They were pretty good in transition this year. They're back where they normally are, top 25 in fast break points scored. Holloman was a big part of that, but I think the best guard they had is the next guy we'll talk about. Let's talk about, about him now. One, Jeremy Fears. Only played 12 games. Yeah. Right. 12 games. Didn't start any games. He averaged uh, 15 minutes a game when he was playing. He was shot 50% from the field on very lim limited volume, 15 for 30. Uh, he's He only hit one three out of six attempts. 11 for 17 from the line for 65%. He averaged a little over two rebounds a game, or no, about two rebounds a game. 
uh, 40 assists to 13 turnovers, so three and a half to one or so. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is true. Right. Razor, 10 yep. steals, and this is again in, in 12 games played, two blocks. Uh, of all the freshmen, there's no question he was the most ready to play. He was, I mean, yeah. you shot him out of cannon. Within five minutes, my wife turned to me and she said, I don't, I don't know who he is, but he's my favorite player now. Uh, just yeah. because the intensity, the ability... Um, well, I, just everything about his game, you just like because he plays hard, plays fast. He looks like yep. a guy who, if you were to construct some a, a guard to play for Michigan State, you couldn't construct a better player than Jeremy Fears. Maybe you could make him a little bit yeah. taller, but outside of that, I mean, he's exactly what you want. And assuming he's recovered from injury too, the athleticism uh, that is yep. somewhat surprising, you know, because he can really get up and um, he can do some stuff. Yeah, and then, you know that's going to be the question. He said uh, it was just before the tournament started. Uh, it was the first time he'd spoken, and he said that he's on track by summer. Mm-hmm. He said summer. He expects to be fully back to all basketball-related activities. So that's great news. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if that means the beginning of June, in which case we're only basically a couple months away from that. Um, he looks pretty good. I mean, you've seen him in the warm-up lines, right? Yeah. I mean, I would say I, I felt he was limping. Uh, but then also, uh, some. I, I'll i be honest, I don't remember exactly what his gait was. And some guys kind of have like a, you know, like I, a, yeah. you know, I'm not yeah. sure. So I think that's, I think that's the case. Um, I think he looks pretty good with what I've seen. And so if it's true that he's fully back in June, then, you know, we'll start to find out. We'll. We'll get early indications in Moneyball as to how he looks. But you're right. The, the one thing you hope wasn't negatively impacted is the explosion because that was something that I think really um, is something that quietly separates him from a lot of guys. But look, the way the way he played the game, I mean, that 15 for 30 shooting number is outstanding. So basically that means he was 14 of 24 on twos right yeah that's outstanding and you know people will talk about well can he prove to you know be capable of shooting and that was a knock on his game coming in Mm -hmm. but i'm not so worried about that one i think he will get better as a shooter i'm convinced of that Um, i don't see any reason why he shouldn't be at least a decent shooter and i think he's he has a work ethic and he'll get better at it. But he has got an ability to get himself into the lane that will make him an impact player no matter what. Yeah, It just will. Um, I think he was their best transition guard immediately. I think he has a, a consistency in looking to push. He was defensively... I. It's such a disappointment that he didn't get to play in the Big Ten season because yeah. I think he would have been a nightmare for opposing point guards to have to deal with. He looked so good defensively. And then running the offense, you mentioned it, basically a three to one ratio. This is a guy I I think there's a you know, it's something we're not used to seeing at Michigan State, but I think with this cast of characters, there's good reason to think that I don't know if they'll be as good in their turnover rate next year, but I don't expect them to be back to the bad old days. Right. You know, where they really struggled. And he's a big part of that because he's just, he's a nice combination of a guy who is very much a dynamic player who creates chances for others, but yet he's not prone to going for the home run ball all the time, which leads to, can lead to mistakes. Yeah, right. I just... I just think he's a great combination of the solid and spectacular. You don't see all the time. Yeah. So assuming full health, um, I'm incredibly excited to see what he brings next year. And I think he's the guy. He's he's the he's next. Yep. Yeah, and if you want a solid and spectacular, there's no better place to go than the brothers just your gutters rod. They take care of they can replace, repair. They can clean out your gutters. They can put leaf guards on. They can do all this stuff, and you need it done now if you've got some problems. Get them to get them to take care of it now while the season's just beginning. There's no better time to reach out to them, whether you're on the east side or the west side of the state of Michigan, you're Kurt and his team on the Grand Rapids area, or Greg and his team in the metro Detroit area. Uh, they will take care of you. They're 
fantastic pricing, great crews that get the, get the job done. Uh, if it's a big job, a little job, whether it's your house, maybe your business, they can take care of just about anything. Um, so you can't go wrong with them. And again, we only have great sponsors here who do great work. And so I'd highly recommend them. You can check out, find them on their support page at the final force on schedule.com slash support. And you can get a way uh, to get an estimate 10% off. If you mentioned final four, uh, when you uh, go to get your estimate. Uh, so let's move on to, I get, I guess we'll say the, the four <laughs> we'll start with just Malik Hall, I guess, uh, started 34, 35 games. I don't even remember the game he didn't start, but um, was he injured a game? I can't even remember. Anyway, he played about 1,000 minutes this season, also so averaged 28 and a half minutes a game, shot 52.5% from the field, 20 for 61 for the three, so a little under 1-3 a game, shooting 33%. He was 73% from the line. He averaged uh, 5.7 rebounds a game and uh, had 66 assists at 50 turnovers, 18 steals, 10 blocks, and as you mentioned before, once he sort of got rolling this season, um, he was consistently one of their best players. He was a guy you could always count on to, if nothing else, play good defense. Um, but even you know, at least chip in like eight, ten points, sometimes more. You know, would flex up at times and definitely good rebounding presence as well. So really great senior year for him. I was really nice to see that from him because the knock on him had always been that he's inconsistent. And I think a lot of that was yeah. carried over from one, he's a freshman and didn't really get a lot of minutes. And there were, you know, he definitely would sort of show up and not show up in certain games. But by the time he even got his last, the year, previous season, then he got injured and it just, you know, he just was never right. And this year he was healthy all year. So it definitely showed and he played well. Uh, look, I mean, uh, I don't, I don't have any issues with the year that he had. Um, you just look across the board, 53% from the floor. That's outstanding. 33% from three, maybe a little bit under where you would have liked it. To sure. be. I think he was at 35 before the Carolina game. Yeah. So he took a little bit of a dive there right at the end. Um, but, uh, you know, respectable. Um, he was a 5.7 5 rebounds a game which is decent. It's not spectacular, but over the last half of the season, he was clearly their best rebounder. Uh, he gave them a post presence that they sorely needed. Um, just it was solid defensively. I mean, I think, I think Tyson Walker was their best player all the way around, but Malik Hall was probably the guy they had to lean on the most over the last three months, especially. Yeah. Because he was the guy that game in, game out had to be there because of the inconsistency of the other post players, right? Yep. So, well, I, there was no one to I'm replace glad him. He came, right. I'm glad he came back. I'm glad he had the season he had. Um, it's a positive one to remember his career by. And it's a shame because it's bookended with, you know, his freshman season is the all time what if. Yeah. You know, where Michigan State, he could have been remembered as being part of the Final Four team very easily. Yeah. So, stupid COVID. But a great year from him. Yeah. And he was definitely the player. If if he had a bad game, that team just had no answers for sort of recovering from right. that. And like when he was bad in Northwestern, right. I mean, they just got run out of the gym because there's, you know, you could have Tyson could have a day where he can't score real well, which didn't happen too much, but it, you could still find ways to score and, and sort of overcome that but yeah Malik have being a hole in there it was just it was bad news so yep. uh the other four was uh Xavier Booker freshman started two games this season uh mostly at the five when he started he was playing the five he averaged a little under uh 10 minutes a game uh, which was mainly late in the season shot 44 percent from the field he was 33 percent from three on decent volume for a guy who didn't play a whole lot 16 for 48 for the yep. year didn't get to the line a whole lot, 12-19 for 63%. Damn. He averaged uh, 1.7 rebounds a game. He had six assists, seven turnovers, three steals, and 14 blocks. So in very limited time, he had quite a uh, decent presence there as well. And uh, there is no question that um, he was a five-star in the sense that from a skill standpoint, the physical attributes, uh, he was there, except that he was a little... Uh, I don't want to say small or weak or something, but he definitely needed to put on some weight and to, to especially once you get to the no, big ten. No, you could say that. You could <clears throat> say that. Yeah, that's accurate. Um, 
And, uh, but you can definitely see the great player that's there. Uh, but you can also see why he didn't play right away. I mean, if you're watching him in November, he was 100%. clueless. But I feel like he figured out the, I got to play hard. I got to play tough. There's still times you're like, ah, you just got to do, you know, really get in there. But I have a lot of hope expectation for him next year. I think there's, yeah. I mean, I, I, too. I expect him to start and I expect him to be a really good player and really good force in that, um, on both ends actually. And so I, the one, the one thing he's got to figure out the defensive end a little bit more. And I think much like, I feel like the one problem with Jaron Jackson is I think he looked for his three point shot a little too much. And I feel like the same might be said for uh, Xavier Booker. Um, but outside of that, I think he's going to, he's got a really bright future. Yeah. I, I agree with a lot of that. Um, you know, it's funny. One of the, one of the things that the Michigan state coaching staff has gotten tagged on this year is, well, where's, Where's the development that used to happen in this program? We need Dwayne Stevens. And I get I, Well, and I, yeah. Meanwhile, I heard the same thing about him for 15 years. Um, <laughs> and, and it was wrong. You know, and, and I get that. Look, you can you could say that certain guys, you know, A.J. Hogarth was basically the same guy for the last three years of his career. They never got over the hump. So some of that, some of that is on the coach and some of it's on the player too. But right. Um, if we're going to, if we're going to say that, what about, did Tyson Walker get better? Did Malik Call get better over the course of his careers? I'd say that the answer to that is obvious <laughs> that they did. Now again, how much do you give the coaching staff credit for that? How much do you give the players? That's always, it's tough unless you're right down in the trenches to know the exact answer to that. But we can say it's some of both. Um, I think despite all the caterwauling about not playing Xavier Booker enough, there's a pretty good argument looking at where he was in November and where he was in that North Carolina game that they made exactly the right call and that he improved substantially over the course of this season. I think there's an argument for that. Now, the problem is the unknown is undefeated. <laughs> And so we can't know how he would have been yeah. had he played more earlier. But I can make an educated guess. I think that all the reasons why he was ranked highly were evident and all the reasons why there were people. And I'll admit to being a little too, I was a little too bullish yeah. on Booker. I thought he would be ready to do the things he was doing in late February and early March earlier. Mm -hmm. And that did not happen. So I'll take the hit on that personally, that I was a little off on that. But there were people, you know, the, the Spartan Mag guys, Jim Comperoni, Paul Conondike, I'll give them credit. They were adamant from, from last spring that even before that, when Booker was still in high school, they were consistent in saying, this is going to be a long road. And a lot of people didn't want to believe that. I I, I knew that they had a point with regard to certain things, namely his strength and his motor. Yeah. I just thought that his physical attributes and his skill set would override that stuff a little earlier. It turned out that wasn't the case. Um, but I think what happened in the meantime was, he got better in the areas he needed to. He got stronger. Um, he started figuring out how hard he needed to play. He's not all the way there yet, but he started figuring that out. Yep. And doing those things enabled his skill set, his ability to shoot, his length, which I think is going to be a big factor down the line defensively for Michigan State. Um, he's got, I'm not going to say he's quite at the Jaron Jackson level, but man, I think he's going to be hell of a, a weak side defender <laughs> yeah. of his length just to, you know, not on ball, but to come over on a guy from the weak side and take a shot away. Absolutely. You're going to see that. Now, there are a lot of strides that need to continue to be made. He needs to continue to get stronger. I would argue particularly his lower body because I think that's the biggest issue. It's not so much that, you know, sometimes you'll see guys – where their upper body's an issue, they get they get to a rebound in traffic and they can't secure it because they're not strong enough in the upper body to do so. They get knocked around and they lose possession of the ball. 
I didn't see that as a huge problem for no. book. What I saw was more difficulty in terms of holding position, which is primarily a lower body thing. And so that's got to continue to come. Um, I think his defensive awareness improved significantly during the course of the year. Yep. But he's not all the way there yet. Yep. That's got to continue to improve. And then I would agree with you. I, I think that his shot selection was tilted too much toward the perimeter. And it's not that he's not a capable shooter. He obviously is. But, you know, you saw that second basket, so not the three, but the one he scored in the lane against Carolina. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's something that he can do. He can face, I saw him do it in high school. He could face people up 20 feet from the rim and go by them. And with that praying mantis length that he has... (laughs) He can finish plays from much further away from the basket than you might think than a normal human being can. <laughs> you know, that's a weapon that I think you will hopefully see him go to more often. I don't expect that he's ever going to be really a back to the basket post up guy. I just, even if he gets strong enough to do it, I just don't think that's something that's in his game. The best case scenario would be maybe you get a little bit of where they got to with late career Marcus Bingham, where maybe he could do a little bit of that. But I, I, I think him in transition and him on the face-up game, kind of similarly to the way we talked about this during the season, somebody like Coleman Hawkins is able to do that. Somebody like Dawson Garcia is able to do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They're able to face guys up and, and use the dribble drive to get opportunities. I think Xavier Booker has those elements. So I would expect and hope we'll see more of that. I think the three is always going to be an important part of his game. One, because he can do it. Two, because Michigan State will want to do that. And I think they will look to do that. They will, with him playing more minutes, that pick and pop element that was sort of lacking this year will be back in the, the back in the mix with, yeah. with Booker out there. No question. And I th- and I think too, like the transition or um, the trailing four, you know, at the top of the key, it, that I think yeah, you're going to see too. that you're going to see a yeah. lot more of that, and that's the thing that you never saw yeah. Malik ever look for, and that was a big, big part of Joey Hauser's game. Absolutely, no, it's 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 a nice, it's certainly a nice weapon to have. I mean, there's no there's no arguing that, but I I think look, it it goes without saying, we're, we're just scratching the surface of <laughs> yeah. what Xavier Booker can be, but I think it's very reasonable to think that he could have an explosive growth in terms of the contributions that he makes to Michigan State. Again, assuming that he's still on the team right now, from what I hear, there's not any concern. He said it himself after the North Carolina game that he's coming back. So I think, you know, that's the thing. I think that in the end, if if you're reasonable, and I have no reason to think that he and his family are not reasonable, if you look at, don't get caught up in the numbers, don't get caught up in the rankings, all of that stuff, but you look at, just look at the games, look at the tape. The tape doesn't lie, right? Mm-hmm. Look at the way he played in November versus the way he was playing in that game against North Carolina, and I think it's unquestionable that you see serious growth. So... Did that happen primarily because Michigan State handled him the way that it did? I would argue yes. Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, the fact that if he was jacking up the threes in November and shooting at 20% or 33%, I think it wouldn't have gotten people quite as excited. I think the fact that he was able to slowly develop into that role and hit a couple later, you know, I mean, he really didn't emerge until really January, maybe late December. I can't remember exactly when, when you actually started seeing him play a little bit. Um, And, you know, I wonder if that was a little bit of a problem with Max Christie, like they were expecting so much shooting right from the start. And I think he was trying to, you know, fill that role and it just wasn't the right, you know, he wasn't quite ready for that aspect of his game and, but he played because he played great defense, but it was kind of nice the way they sort of pulled Booker along in this development. And I was just talking to a surgeon today and he's like, yeah, we had the, this five star and he wasn't playing I'm like, yeah, but he wasn't quite ready and sure looks pretty good right now. And you read it, you can see the the progression, right? And you worry, you'd hate to destroy his confidence before he even makes it out of the floor. It, it's, it's really important 
that and it's always been the case in Michigan State's program, or I should say, when it hasn't been the case, it's been a problem. Um, that guys earn the role that they have. Mm-hmm. You know, we were just having this discussion on the Spartan Mag board today, and someone was talking about, you know, the dynamic they had with Tom Tom Nairn and Cassius Winston. And I said, you know, the most important thing about Tom's role on that team was, in my opinion, but, but then there were a lot of important things, his leadership, his personality, his defense, all those things matter. But the most important thing to me was that Tom Tom's presence meant that Cassius Winston had to earn his role. He was right. he was able to be held accountable to shore up the defensive deficiencies that he had, and only then was he allowed to become the guy. Yeah. at that position. And that process took a while. That took, you know, the entirety of his <laughs> freshman year. Yeah, year and a half. <laughs> and then as a sophomore, then as a sophomore, he became the starter. And, you know, he went on from there and became one of the greatest Spartans of all time. But I think the, that that factor early on in his career was hugely important. I, I, I don't expect Xavier Booker to be a four-year guy, but I do I don't think it's entirely a dissimilar situation that it was important that he had to be accountable and he had to improve rather than before he got minutes rather than just be handed them. Yeah. I think you can already see the the evident difference. Yeah. No question. Uh, well, let's just talk about Cohen Carr because I don't really know where to put him. I mean, he's a three, he's a four. I think he's going to play more three. He played all 35 games this year, uh, did not start. Uh, he played average a little over 11, almost 11 and a half minutes a game, which more earlier, I think, in the season. And then by the time that we got to Big Ten play, yeah. uh, rotation squeezed a little bit. He played less. Uh, shot 65% from the field. Not surprising since almost all shots were dunks or pretty close to it. Uh, shot actually quite a few free throws, 50 free throws, <laughs> more than Jay Nakins and Trey Holloman uh-huh. combined. He's 28 for 50, yep. so not very good at the line, 56%. Average a little over three points a game. Uh, he had a little under two rebounds a game. He had nine assists, 18 turnovers, 18 steals, and 18 blocks. So, <laughs> I mean, he kind of, ah. those stat lines sort of are what you expect. Uh, and, uh, you know, his deficiencies, obviously, loud. shooting, yeah, loud, loud and athletic, and all the flying all over the place. Loud plays, right? Yeah, we knew that coming in, and he did not disappoint in terms of his athleticism and how that shows up on offense and on defense. Um, where the improvement that now you know we talked about Xavier Booker becoming much better in terms of his defensive awareness, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. as the year wore on. I don't think the same thing happened with Cohen. And it's, you know, it's hard to know. Defense is always the toughest thing to project for these high school players because I, I don't even know if people who don't watch much high school or AAU basketball realize it, but guys are just not asked to do the kinds the kinds of things they have to do right out of the chute in college. They are, generally speaking, you do not, and there are exceptions to this rule, but generally speaking, particularly in AAU, you're not facing sophisticated offense. So you're not facing anybody doing anything within light years to what, say, Cohen Carr has to do if he's trying to guard Fletcher Lawyer <laughs> right. against Purdue. That You're not seeing that, you know, and yeah. you didn't see it in your prep school games either. You just didn't. And and so it's hard. The thing you could say about Cohen Carr, much like you could say about Xavier Booker, is, well, all the physical tools are there where he should be capable of being a good defender. But what you can't project easily is what's the likelihood that he's going to grasp everything quickly, conceptually, that he has to be able to grasp it. What, how how well can he can he dissect tape? You know, can he watch video and and learn the things he needs to learn from that? You know, um, how well can he follow a game plan? Mm-hmm. You know, you don't know those things. And it goes the other way, too. I mean, I remember being very pleasantly surprised by how good a defender Keith Applin was immediately. 
because most of why Keith Appling was a highly rated basketball player coming out of high school was what he did on the offensive end. Right. You know, with one exception, I saw him play against Ray McCallum, who ended up playing, he played for Country Day, and he ended up playing for his dad at U of D. Um, that was the only game I, I really saw Keith get after somebody defensively in high school because it was one of the few times he was ever challenged by anybody, you know? But he came into Michigan State as a freshman and immediately was an effective defender. Xavier Tillman, no idea, had no clue that he was going to be that good that quickly on defense. The flip side of it is some got Brendan BJ Dawson was another example, a guy who got it immediately. Mm -hmm. Owen Carr, you hoped that might be the case. And the fact is it wasn't. So now you're going into an off season. Can he make those strides? So I think with him, that's the biggest thing to me. Can he become a reliable, connected part of the defensive scheme? If he can, then he can get more minutes. That should hopefully enable his rebounding, because I think we didn't even scratch the surface of what he can be and should be as a rebounder. Right. We didn't really see it except in brief moments this year. Yeah. But there's no good reason he should not be a plus-plus rebounder. And then, you know, the other thing would be offense. Um, I think he shows the potential to be able to do some damage off the dribble. I mean, I think he's actually got a reasonably good handle for a guy who's not a pure guard. And with his athletic ability, boy, he just <laughs> needs to get close to that rim and it's over. <laughs> you know, kind of, kind of like with Book. It's it's not too dissimilar. Carr's another guy that I think is capable from score, of scoring further away from the basket but still at close range than most people can. Um, he doesn't have quite the length, but his explosion helps him make up for that. Yeah. Um, the question is always going to be, can he develop a jumper? Look, I saw the kid hit threes in prep school. I saw him do it. <laughs> and I and I think he's capable of developing into that. But when he's going to get the green light is is another issue. And then there's maybe the biggest thing for next year, which I think also will have real ramifications on what MSU can and will try to do in the portal is what is he positionally? Yeah. Because if he's a wing, which is how they recruited him and mostly how they played him this year, mm -hmm. if he's a wing, that's seven perimeter guys you got. I don't think you're adding anybody else to that. Okay? If he's a four, then maybe you can add a guy. But I think it really matters Yeah, from, from that perspective. So he's a very key guy. I think it, it, it also should be mentioned, too, the same thing would apply to Booker to some extent. Is he a four or is he a five? I happen to think he's probably going to end up mostly as a four. Yeah. But they did play him at the five some this year. So which way they see him primarily might impact what kind of guy you go after. So I'll give you an example. There's a, where this the rubber hits the road on this. There's a guy, if you've been paying attention, as I assume most listeners have been to the NCAA tournament, there's a kid on Oakland's team, Trey Townsend, who had an outstanding year. He was Horizon League Player of the Year. He scored, I think he scored 30 in, he scored 30 in their win against, no, he scored 30 in their loss, I think. Um, Tennessee State, yeah. In their second round, Tennessee State. Yeah, I believe he had 30 and 6 in that game. Uh, he wasn't their leading scorer against uh, Kentucky. That was the guard they have. <laughs> but um, anyway, Trey Townsend, outstanding year. He's been there four years. He could take a COVID year. Now, my my feeling had always been because he's a rare, it's very rare example of a kid who grew up loving Oakland because his dad played for Oakland. Yeah. So he was already sort of at his dream school. It wasn't this normal, well, guy's just willing to use a mid-major as a stepping stone. Mm -hmm. he, could have, he could have hit the portal and found a high major to land at last year and he'd do it. But I have seen Greg Campy say in the last couple of days that he's actually, he almost seems to be encouraging him to do it because he can get a payday that he can't get at Oakland. Sure. So I've been skeptical of that. It, to my knowledge, he hasn't yet officially entered the portal, 
but I guess I wouldn't be as surprised as I was, say, a few days ago mm -hmm. if he does that. So you would say, okay, well, that's a Michigan-based kid. That's a guy, you know, he's a proven scorer. He's done it against big-time opposition. He's hurt Michigan State in the past. <laughs> that would be a guy, right? Yeah. But if Xavier Booker is going to be primarily a four, forget Cohen Carr. If Xavier Booker is going to be primarily a four, um, where are the minutes for Trey Townsend? Right. Trey Townsend's not going anywhere to play 13 minutes a game. No. Now, if, if you're telling me Xavier Booker is going to be the five, which, again, I don't subscribe to, let's just say for the sake of argument, that that's his role, well, then maybe you could add Trey Townsend. But if Booker's a four, you're probably looking, if you're going to add anybody, you're probably looking at a five. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Makes sense? So that's that's where all this positional stuff with Carr and Booker, again, assuming they're on the roster, that's yeah, where yeah, it matters. Right, right, yeah, sure. Yeah, interesting stuff. So, um, well, let's uh, talk briefly about the Squeegee Squad of Grand Rapids. If you need your windows cleaned, check out the Squeegee Squad in Grand Rapids. Uh, they can wash your windows. They can wash your house. It is that time of year. You got to get your house cleaned up after all the muddy muck that ends up on the side of your house from the snow and all that kind of junk from winter. So check them out. They do fantastic work. They did a great job at my house. I can't recommend them enough. Uh, you can find all their stuff at our um, ways to contact Troy and his team at the squeegee squad of Grand Rapids at our support page at the final force on the schedule.com slash support and our hats off to Troy who decided not to fill out a bracket thinking that that might be what pushed me. She would push me say over the edge to get to final four. Unfortunately, it didn't quite work out. Uh, so anyway, we all do what we can as fans. That's why they call them fans. It's short for fanatic, right? <laughs> so, uh, so check out the squeegee squad of Grand Rapids. You won't regret it. All right. So let's talk about, well, I don't know. I guess there has been a little bit of controversy this year in the five position for Michigan state. So let's talk about the fives huh. briefly. Huh. <laughs> uh, we'll start with Marty. A little so, bit. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. There's been a little bit of discussion on what to do at the five spot. So Marty Soko started 26 of 35 games. He actually was number two on the team at the five spot, at least in minutes played at 500 minutes, every 15.3 minutes a game. Uh, he was shot 57% from the field, didn't attempt a three. He was 31 of 44 from the line for 70%. And he started that year. He was like 90s for most of the year. And then he really uh, tailed off at the end there. Uh, but anyway, so he averaged a little over three points a game, had uh, over five rebounds a game, which is a little bit, he had some games where he'd cycle up to like 10, 11, and then uh, less than that. So nine assists, 32 turnovers, eight steals, 15 blocks. And um, I think Madi's, the the one thing you could say about Madi, I think, aside from all the great kids, all that kind of thing, and, you know, he's a great person and all that stuff. Uh, I would say he did not improve much from the year before. The Madi we saw at the last, the tail end of the season, like the last few games is I think the Mahdi everyone wants to see, uh, just a ferocious rebounder, super high energy. Don't worry about how many fouls you have. I mean, not like foul machine, but, uh, you know, play aggressive defense. And and I think when people freak out about him coming back, I think my guess is, my read is that his expectations be much closer to his role at the end of the season than it was at the beginning. Like there's not going to be any expectation from starting. He's going to be playing. 10 to 15 minutes a game to bring in that energy to spell whoever it is who's the starter. And that's kind of how I see his role if he comes back. And for all the obvious reasons he's coming back from a, he's a foreign born kid. He doesn't have access to the NIL. He's playing. I don't want to say he's playing for money, but I think, I think the NIL is definitely what helps him support, you know, all the, the things he's doing with his money back home in Mali and if he were to go try another college, he's not going to have that opportunity really for with that NIL money. Then he, his other option would be going play pro, where he's probably not going to make the same amount of money either. So, you know, in so many ways, it makes sense for him to stick around Michigan State. And he obviously has, he's not bothered by the coaching staff. At least that's my impression. I mean, I think that's, he's totally comfortable with the way they coach and play him. Yeah, I, I think you're right. And that's, that's sort of where I've landed with what's most likely to happen, because I'll, I'll admit I've been assuming that it was probably going to be done for him at the end of this year, but I'm I'm not thinking that way. Basing that off the little bit that Izzo said and then just thinking all of these aspects through, um, look, 
Is it is it likely that Madi takes a great leap forward and starts to play at the levels we saw against Gonzaga in Kentucky last year on a game in game out basis? No, you would you would conclude by now that that's not the case, but um, it's not impossible. The other thing I would say is if we get the Madi that we saw over the last say four games of the season in that role. I'd take it without missing a beat. Yeah. Because that's a very effective backup center that you've got. I mean, that guy, the energy he played with, the way he rebounded again consistently um, he, against Carolina, he hit a couple of uh, post ups. Really? I still think he's capable of doing that. He didn't do it very well this year, very consistently, but he is capable of it. Um, you know, there's some there's some aspects to Mati Sissoko's game that in the right role, you would absolutely say could be valuable for a team. Um, yeah, right now, I would assume that he's back. That would be my yeah. assumption. And uh, unless and until we, we see otherwise. But I don't think the personnel movement that is going to need to happen in order for them to add somebody in my opinion, at least, um, I don't think it's pro- it's very likely to come from him. I think he'll be there, and you're right in a in a certain kind of role. Um, he can be he can be helpful. I think that's a role that he's comfortable with too, and I think that's the thing. Yeah, that I know he's not. He, he's not going to be demanding play me 28 right. minutes or I'm gone. He's, that, that's yeah, not he's okay happen. with that. Yeah, and that's important yeah. too to have a guy like that on your team who's understands yep. like you know I'm not. Uh, you know, whatever. So uh, next would be Carson Cooper, who played the most minutes at the five. He started eight of the games. So he was the guy who would almost sub in really about two and a half minutes in the most games. That was always sort of the plan. So he averaged a little yeah. over 17 minutes a game, 52.6% from the field, 40 of 76. Uh, he did attempt a three, which I do not recall. It must have been a hand grenade at some point. I don't remember. Yeah. Uh, 38 of 60 from the line for 63%. So eh, not too great yeah. there. Uh, it got better though. It got he better. did get better. Yeah, he was definitely doing better at, the, at the later. The, he, similar to Mati, he averaged three point four points a game, four point four rebounds a game, uh, fifteen assists to twenty six turnovers, fifteen steals, twenty three blocks. Uh, he actually led the team in blocks. Uh, so you know, I think he took a step forward. He's better than he was last year, but I think not probably the for progress sure. we had hoped for. Uh, yes, that coming into the to the year, but. As I point out to everybody else, you know, these are the same guys who they had, except they're all probably a little better than like were the year before. And they made a sweet 16 run, almost made the lead eight. So it's not like there's this massive, some, you know, brand new hole or the players are playing a lot worse than last Correct. year. They they were pretty much the same guys or a little well, bit better. They just, you know, it was the other things that were the problem with the team. But anyway, just talking about Carson, I think. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll push back against that a little bit in the following okay. way. I don't think since Mahdi and Carson were the two guys who got the most time over the course of the year, I don't think either of those guys was as good defensively as they were the year before. Okay. Now, Michigan State still had a great team defense overall, but I thought, particularly Carson at the end of the year, I thought was really making strides defensively. And it wasn't that he was terrible. I just don't think he was as consistently good The other thing that was disappointing about both of them is that I thought they would have and should have been better options on rim dives offensively, so off the pick-and-roll game, being able to catch lobs. And I don't think it was – look, I'm more than happy, because I spent a lot of time doing it this year, to talk about how Michigan State's guards were disappointing and how that was the biggest problem they had, and I believe that. But I won't hold those guys responsible for not trying to force those kind of plays on offense because, one, I just didn't think those guys were presenting themselves very consistently. And two, even when they did, they weren't they weren't catching and finishing as well as they had last year. Yeah. So those were two areas that I do not think they were better than. Carson was clearly much more capable of competing physically that he was a freshman he put in a lot of good work Mm -hmm. to get bigger and i think it showed up i think he was a much more consistent rebounder um i think in terms of post defense he was better because he was better able to 
stand his ground, you know, carve out position. Um, offensively, look, this is where I get with the people crying about the five all the time. Um, the the insistence on pounding the ball inside and especially early in games and trying to get post ups, not not good. That's yeah. that was not something that was productive. Their efficiency rate on those plays was terrible. And, you know, unless there's real improvement, I hope to not see that stuff again. Now, it's interesting to me because, as I mentioned a while ago, if there's going to be a guy brought in at the five, which is what I think is most likely, um, where does that player, what happens? Because they got three guys if Mati comes back. Somebody's got to go. So that means it's either Carson or Jackson Kohler. And and here's the hard part. I don't get the sense that any of those guys want to leave. So yeah. what do you do? This is where it's a very difficult thing. I'm not happy about that circumstance. I can imagine Tom Izzo is extremely not happy about that. Now, is he going to pull one of these two guys aside? And I don't know which one it would be. Um, I have a guess, but I'm not even going to verbalize that because it doesn't really matter. But is he going to pull one of those guys in, aside and say, look, we're intent on bringing somebody in to come in and start at this position. And your minutes are going to get squeezed. They're not going to be what they were last year, most likely. And we're not forcing you out, but you know, you might be the 13th guy and you might not play much. And would that be enough to convince somebody, you know, one of those guys, okay, I guess I need to go somewhere that I can get a more consistent role. Because that's yeah. kind of the dynamic that's in play if if you want this to happen. There, you know, that's that's how almost how it's gotta be. And that's just not the way Michigan State Michigan State's done that, you know. They did it with Foster Lawyer, they did it with um Thomas Kith here. Mm-hmm. So they they've done it, but I don't know. It's not a great. It's not a great place to be. It just gets us talking about Jackson Kohler. Uh, yeah. So he played yeah. twenty one games. He, was, he broke his foot, had surgery right before the season, so he's out basically all the way through. I don't know. Did he come back in December? I can't remember. I think maybe he really January. started playing like it was January first or something like that around there. It was even. It was even after that. Yeah, a little bit. After I think we that. thought he was going to come back a little earlier. So you know, yeah. it wasn't going to be back to normal. This is the same problem that Jaden had the year before, but not quite as ex- much as expected. Jackson, yeah. he had trimmed down physically from what he was the year before. Looked really great. Money ball for what money ball's worth. Uh, ended up ended up averaging nine minutes a game for the games he played. Shot forty three and a half percent from the field. Tried uh, three yeah. triples, missed all of them. Two for seven from the free throw line for only twenty eight percent. So average two points a game, two rebounds a game, four assists, nine turnovers, two steals, 11 blocks, which is kind of remarkable for us. A few minutes as he played uh, defensively seemed a lot better. Uh, and the thing about Jackson is, and this is the, you know, the thing I've got rolling around my mind, because I'm sure for Izzo and the staff, they're trying to figure out, you know, how to sort of manage all this stuff. Like if you bring in, a, let's say you bring in a Cliff Murray, for instance, from Rutgers, you know, yeah. he's going to, there's only one place he can play. That's a five. I mean, he's not going to play anywhere else. Right well, now, Jackson, you could say, well, maybe he plays back up four behind Booker. I, you know, I don't know. I'm just trying to think like, is that something that you could see? And he's got, he's shown some ability to stretch the floor. Probably. Uh, we've seen it in Moneyball, and We know he can shoot. He just didn't, you know, last year was just kind of a weird year because of the, the injury. I mean, is that something you could envision? And then you could say, well, then Carson and, Madi would be your backups, but even then you're kind of like asking Carson probably, I mean, cause you could definitely, I think we'd see Madi being comfortable being backup, but Carson being backup to the backup or something. It's look, it's, it's possible. It's possible. But I, I, I will say this. I think I still believe there is the essence of a very productive basketball player within Jackson Kohler. I agree with you. I thought he was better. He's not great, but he was better defensively. He showed improvement. He worked on his body. He has footwork beyond anybody Michigan State's had in the post in a while, in a long yeah. time. Problem is, he's still not finishing well, and that's something he struggled with as a freshman. Now, I'll admit, when they recruited him, I didn't think it would be a problem because mm-hmm. he'd done it at high-level competition. 
And I've seen guys like him succeed with it. Nick Ward was an earthbound center. Zach Randolph <laughs> was an earthbound center. You can be a guy 6'8", six, 6'9", six, without explosive athletic ability and still finish as a post player. I've seen it done. I assumed Jackson, with his footwork, would do that. I've seen guys, how many guys at Wisconsin have we seen do that over the years, right? <laughs> yeah. So it can be done. It's just he hasn't done it. He's yeah. really struggled. The you know the perimeter of the jump shooting that everybody talked about in the off season that didn't manifest but at all but you know as you said let let's give him a pass because of the circumstances this year I I don't know I don't know if I believe that his athletic ability is such that he can adequately defend at the four I don't know that his purported shooting ability will actually translate to games well enough that you want to play him at the four. I think there's a lot of, I don't know. And so I can see a situation where he's still on the team. I can see one where he sees a better opportunity elsewhere. I don't get any sense that he's anxious to leave. No. Yeah. But I think it, I think it might come down to that. And by the way, I would also not completely rule out that both of those guys might opt to leave. Sure. Yeah. Because if, if, let's say Jackson goes, they bring somebody else in, and you're Carson Cooper, what are you staring at your junior year? Well, you bring in a guy who supposedly is going to start, and then Madi is going to compete with you, at the very least, for backup minutes. What are you looking at? Yeah. You're not looking at expanding your role from this year, that's for sure. You're probably looking at it retrenching. Yeah. So, you know, I, I I think that's the spot. And again, the shame of it is I don't I don't get any sense Carson Cooper particularly wants to leave. So I don't know what happens there, but I'm just trying to lay out these are the mm-hmm. these are the issues when when you bang the drum it's a portal, 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 portal. These are the issues that Tom Izzo is gonna face. And you could say, well, that's why he's paid millions of dollars a year to make tough decisions. All right, that sounds <laughs> cute. That sounds cute. But you sit across the table from one of these kids and his parents, and you tell them, you know those assurances I, I gave to you when I recruited your kid about how I was going to take care of him and we were going to work and make him the best possible player he could be? Well, guess what? Yeah. I, I don't think a lot of people who talk that shit have the stones <laughs> To have that conversation. I'm not saying Tom is a won't. I suspect he's probably going to make a move at that position. I'm just saying that's not a position I'd want to be in. Not in right. this case. There's yeah. There's been a handful of guys over the years that I think those were very easy conversations to say, you know, Kenny Kaminsky, Garrick Sherman, maybe you're best off somewhere else. Okay. These guys, No. Yeah, that's not an easy conversation to have. Yeah, you definitely get. I mean, Jack's color is a guy I watch play. I'm like, man, this guy looks like a guy who plays at Bradley, you know, the Missouri Valley or something like that. Yeah, um, and he could really just that, carve that up might, that, that might be that might be what works for him. I don't know. Yeah, I, I still, yeah, as knows? I say, I'm still convinced there's a very effective college player inside Jackson Kohler. He just needs to be healthy, and he just he needs to be able to finish those plays around the rim. And all of a sudden, the picture looks a lot better because he made strides defensively. So I think it's possible at least at the five, that he can become a competent defender. And I think he's got a knack for rebounding, particularly on the offensive end, that I think if he was playing big minutes, could mm-hmm. actually show up as a real positive. So yeah. I think there, there's an equation there. It just hasn't all come into place yet. And it might yeah. not ever fully come into place. You're, you know, he's halfway through his career now. Yeah. So it is fair to say, well, is this the point? <laughs> that you make a call on it, you know? Right. Well, yeah, and that's the, that's the question that he has to ask himself and that the staff has to ask themselves. Well, that Tom is has got to ask be. himself is where yeah. that starts. Well, sure. Yeah. Yeah. What he thinks. Yeah. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's move on to just real brief discussion. The walk-ons, David Smith, he's departing the team. He's graduated uh, 12 games. He played 2.3 minutes a game. He was three for 10 from the field for three, Thirty percent, two for five. So he's one of the best three point shooters in the team. Uh, hit that big th- hit three at the big one end of the against yeah, the, Mississippi State. Like, yep, against Mississippi State. Yep, five for seven <laughs> line for seventy one percent. Two assists, a turnover, a block, uh, and uh, 
couple tur- rebounds this season. He was a guy who you felt like disaster strikes, like, I don't know, fluid breaks out in the team and he has to not start but play significant minutes as a point guard or something like, well, you could probably survive a few minutes. And it was really great yeah. watching him uh, get those free throws at the end of the first half of the Michigan game when Doug McDonough. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, so... Yeah. And the and clearly a good vocal leader on yeah a good uh, a good vocal leader in the team. I mean he that yep. many players mentioned that he sort of called him out. Uh, you know, yep. so a great and that's that's the role. What you, you what you hope for for like a senior walk on who can kind of play. I mean, I'm sure it's scout you know scout team guy and stuff. So good for him. I don't he have much more to add besides that. He could have as opposed to the other two walk ons where I'm not sure that's the case. I think right. they he could have played somewhere else D one. Could somewhere. have played at a lower level D one. Yeah. Not not as a main guy, but I think he could have been in somebody's rotation at a small D one school. Yeah, like I think Elkhorn. he probably yeah. got good enough. He probably got good enough to do that. Yeah. And he flirted with it for a little bit and then decided to go back to Michigan right. State. Decided to come back. Yep. Uh, so then Nick Sanders, uh, he played nine games, played 12 minutes. He was one for four, uh, hit that one, three. And I think early in the season with off an assist from C. Mizzo for his first yep. three points, first points is a collegiate career, uh, and had, that's pretty much it. He didn't have any rebounds or anything else. And so, um, not much more to say about him except, you know, good addition, obviously like a celebrity sort wow. of uh, player. He's the one, he's the one guy that'll be back. Yeah, he's the one who'll be back. I, I, the last... I assume. I assume. Right. Yeah, and and then there's obviously Stephen Izzo who played one extra game because I think Sanders didn't get to come in during the Mississippi State game. So, mm-hmm. right. And as mentioned before, when he started the show, that he did one of the highlights of the season was he hit that and one after on, in his fifth yep. year, finally scored a point despite missing a two free throws early the last I think this year. Uh, yeah, he missed was over two and so anyway, pretty cool for him and uh, obviously meant a lot to him. He was. For his, what he managed, I think, through his career is somewhat remarkable. To be the coach's son, to be a guy who is was you know backup on his high school basketball team, so he clearly you know had no business being on the you know D T one basketball team, but uh, was endeared by his other teammates. I mean, they seemed to really enjoy him and have yeah, and, you know, to be in that spot to not have a people say, you know, you're privileged, whatever. And I remember even when he got on the team and people were, some people were grumbling about, you know, why are you wasting a spot? Which of course right. walk on spots, so who cares? Uh, but I think he's shown his, his utility and his usefulness. And, you know, well, so, I think that for the, him. the, the biggest tribute for him is the way his teammates reacted to him. So clearly they didn't feel, they didn't seem to feel that he was entitled or, you know, they obviously all embraced him. So I think that's testament to um, what he did over the course of his five years. And yeah, that moment against Rutgers, I think it was, um, was great, great to see. Um, yeah. And that it came in a Big Ten game too was was really nice. But um, yeah, I, I think um, I think it's yeah you got to give you got to give him a lot of credit for handling that the way that it, by all accounts that he did. And um, yeah. so hats off to him. But yeah, I think next year we're likely to see a couple new walk-ons because he and David Smith are gone. Um, it'll be interesting to see what they did. We had that discussion on the Spartan Mag board today. <laughs> Preferred walk-on today. or something, yeah. Yeah, and you know, that is a role, just quickly, that's a role that has been a big part of Tom Izzo's program. There are a lot of guys. You can go Tim Bogracos, um, Austin Thornton, uh, Mike Keebler, uh, obviously, Kenny Goins, one of the big Colby Wallenman. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's a number of them, and I'm not talking about like the Matt Trannons. That's a different category. Yeah. But guys who were walk on, most of those guys I mentioned were preferred walk ons, and most of those guys could have actually had scholarship offers from other D1 schools and opted to walk on at Michigan State. But that's been something they've made real use of, and. I can actually see a value in that going forward because in this portal area, you know, there's a lot of talk, well, nobody wants to use 13 scholarships. And the purported reason for that is you don't want to scare guys off. But there could be a value in, you know, a a walk-on isn't necessarily going to scare anybody off, but if you can get somebody who has a chance to develop into something, that's still a value for your program. So it'll be interesting to me to see what Michigan... Oh, I mentioned Jack Hoiberg was another example mm-hmm. of a guy yeah. like that. So um, 
it'll be interesting to me to see what Izzo opts to do this offseason with the walk-on spots. Because for the last few years, it hasn't been the way, you know, more often than not, he's had a guy that if he wasn't already playing, or even Braden Burke, if you remember, I think it is 6'11 walk-on at one point. Um, <laughs> he didn't end up playing a role, but when they brought him in, he had come from another D1 from Robert Morris. Yeah. So the feeling was, well, he might be able to contribute. More often than not, they've had a guy who, if he wasn't already contributing, there was the thought that he might be able to. And so it'll be interesting to me if he goes back to that, but we'll see. Yeah. All right. Well, I think... I think we'll uh, wrap it up there. This has been a deep dive into the season wrap up for Michigan state. We're going to take a spring break. And so we'll see you guys after spring break. Uh, not only check out our sponsors we talked about, but also nudge printing. They're providing the, the prizes for our bracket challenge, which um, I guess is a good time to, to mention briefly that as far as the notables in the, the bracket challenge, my son is beating my wife barely. He's 10th. I think she's 11th or 11th and 12th. I think I'm somewhere in the fifties. I'm being beaten by, uh, oh, and Gabe is actually from Get Nudge Printing is the 14th. So again, if he's, if he manages to pull this off, he's going to have to, I guess he'll get his own free merchandise. I'm not sure what'll happen, but, um, and then Bracket Dom's doing pretty well. I think he's like in the top 20. I'm in, like I said, I think I'm in the fifties. I think you're running around 90th or so out of 118. Uh, and then, uh, the, uh, Kurt from the Brothers Jesu Gutters is, I think he's just a couple spots ahead of me as well. So now it's still early, still four rounds left, and some people have Michigan State all the way through to the end, so things can change dramatically. But it's very, it's been a very chalky tournament so far. So kind of a, which yeah, is probably big just surprise, as, big surprise to me. But um, you know, it could be, it it's just as likely to be you. chalky as not chalky, right? I mean, I don't, you know, in some ways yeah. it's, you know, so uh, yeah, we didn't expect that, but hey, there's plenty of time for things to blow up in the. <laughs> in the Sweet 16, too, so who knows what's going to happen in the next second weekend. But anyway, check out Nudge Printing at nudgeprinting.com. Great, great stuff there for Spartan fans. You're going to get, now that weather's turning, you need to get some t-shirts and stuff like that. You can't go wrong, and 20% off you in your order if you type in Final Four in the coupon code. All right, so unless some big, huge news develops, and uh, if it's on spring break, just tough luck. We'll get back to you after spring break. Otherwise, until next time, the Final Four is on the schedule. Go Green. <laughs>